Okay, welcome to my third installment of uh, Windy Day's uh, fishing tips or kayak fishing tips. Um, so I think we've done uh, part one was one through five, part two was six through ten. So this is part three, so it'll be uh, eleven through fifteen. Um, I'll try to put links for the other tips uh, in case you enjoy them. Um, this first tip is both basically a fit in the efficiency plus kind of a safety mix um, and it's got to do with uh, back uh, kayak storage and uh, where we normally would talk about uh, like having the good old milk crate which I think everybody starts out with um, then you graduate and you can go to these uh, back backpacks black packs um, which are like a hundred and thirty dollars now or some wild price. Uh, I happened to buy one off of Craigslist for like 50 bucks a few years ago, but never really got into it. They look cool, but um, the issues that I have with milk crates and even these uh, crates, black crates or whatever, is that um, they're not waterproof or they're not even water resistant. And again, my, my first one is all about the bait. My second saying is salt water corrodes everything. All electronics, everything metal, it's just horrible and to have these things in the back of your kayak where they pr provide really no prevention to that um, is not so good. Uh, the, the second part of it which is kind of a safety issue is if you've ever had a milk crate style bungee strapped in the back of your kayak and then you end up rolling your kayak, you'll find that it's a lot more difficult to roll your kayak back over to ride it uh, based on the fact of the uh, milk crate in the back causing extra drag because it tends to sit above the kayak and then when you're trying to pull it over that uh, the sides of the uh, milk crate are creating drag as you try to spin the kayak over you're forcing it against the water making it a lot more difficult and even more uh, of a risk is when you do use bungees and you just kind of bungee strap them in and they're not really rigidly in is they go into the water um, you take on water when you roll over they take on water especially like this black pack thing here um, and then it's full of water then it has that drag but then you're also talking a ton of extra weight um, that where is also where it becomes a little bit more dangerous it prevents you from getting that thing rolled over really quickly back in your kayak um, a lot of point people have issues with the sharks well, that just adds a few more uh, seconds or longer to try to roll your kayak over. Plus, if you're in extreme cold water, every second counts. You need to get roll that kayak over and get inside as soon as possible. Now, what I've kind of gone down to, and this kind of will help out those guys that are, oh, just only take one rod or two rods and a couple of lures and try the minimalists that are just want to be very efficient about it. If you're one of these hardcore bass guys where you got six rods and uh, eight tackle trays full of stuff then yeah you're gonna have to stick with this because you just need that capacity but for the people that qu might not need so much of that um, I happen to do one of my fun fishing days where I'm just doing very light I'll just throw my stuff in the back well and not have anything but there's occasionally especially like when I go offshore um, or I need extra protection I'll just take a basic ice chest something specifically that has like a locking mechanism to it and even better is if you start getting those upgraded ones that have the, the Yeti styles or any of those kinds where they have the good crap, uh, straps on them that actually they are waterproof from the outside and the inside, even better. Uh, the reason why is twofold. One is that you know, the stuff that you put in there will generally be a lot safer against the water, salt water and the corrosion. Um, water spray coming over, or paddle strokes or wherever, rain. Uh, splash from the uh, re-entering in the, the surf or whatever and it'll pre protect from that overspray where these guys are not going to do anything. Um, the safety part of it is, is that is two part. One, if you happen to flip your kayak over, this ice chest is just going to float away. All right? It's just going to be bobbing in the water waiting for you to get re-enter, get resettled and or your friends that see you will come over. This thing will be bobbing, sitting on top of the water, foot out of the water, it's red and white. Um, everything is still dry in it and it's just bobbing around, not going anywhere. 
collect yourself, go and get it. Um, uh, your stuff inside is still safe and you're good to go. And extreme emergencies, um, even if you have a, a cheap top like this, you can put it upside down and then it becomes a second flotation device that you can hold on to. If you're going to be out for a long time your kayak sinks, sinks, you want stuff like this that is going to add an extra um, buoyancy there. So anyways, that's kind of a, what I like to do. Um, it's not strapped down. If it falls out, it's going to float. You just go back and get it. it makes it a lot easier. Um, even at the end, uh, for efficiency, especially you've got beach guys where you're, you're parked a long way from your car. Um, if you're just using this for carrying stuff, you could just load it up with all your little knickknack stuff, put them in there, and then you have a nice easy carry, and that just takes up a bunch of little knickknack stuff where usually you just try to stick them wherever you can, but that way they're all ready to go. Um, also for your expensive stuff, you throw your fish finder, your GoPro, your wallet, your all your important stuff, you throw it in this and then you take this with you to the car rather than leaving it on the beach. Even your expensive lures, people will still know, so uh, it'll be a little bit more convenient for packing stuff away. But anyways, that's one quick tip and then the rest will follow. Okay, for my next trick, or tip, <laughs> uh, it has to do with this holocore line. I use it, use it a lot, um, using it for my bridge fishing trips, I use it for my quick uh, uh, rope anchor for uh, anchoring my kayak off to uh, pilings or whatever. Uh, use a, my uh, anchor uh, trolley hookup. Um, just a ton of stuff, very useful. The key thing with it is that it floats, so it's really good to use, especially when you don't want to lose something overboard. Um, but the other trick that a lot of people don't know about is that this hollow cord is very good for making um, loops. They're self-made for making loops. And just like this bucket here, um, instead of time, trying to tie on a clip, because these don't knot very well, is that if you put in a loop at the end, it's a lot easier to create just a through loop, slip knot type loop, and then attach it to things. Um, I do this with, and eliminated all the metal components, all the clips and stuff, because corrosion kills everything. Even on my uh, anchor pole, I just have a loop on the end of it so that I could latch it to something, tie it off to something, rather than have like a, everyone uses those carabiners which will rust, break, and so forth. Um, so the way that you can create a, um, a loop in these knots, which there's, are these ropes, and what they're designed to do, the larger ones will actually come with a hollow pin to start it, uh, but what I do is, because the ends are generally flay, frayed, is I'll use a knife, or if you have some really good shears, is cut the uh, uh, rope at kind of an angle so it comes to a point then get your lighter and melt the ends and then kind of compact it and try to keep a little bit of a point on the end it makes it a little bit of it easier then what I do is I'll get a um, kind of measure it out how I want that loop to form what size so I figure that's about good for everything and then you want to have a decent amount that's going to basically we're going to do like one of those um, Chinese finger handcuffs where we're going to insert the tag end into the inside of the hollow core rope and once it's inside there and you pull the slack out of it it's basically locked in there and it's not going to come out again so I'm going to figure out where I want to make my entry point as well as how much uh, uh, slack that I want to have on the inside so I figure we'll go right about there I'll get my pin and then I'll use that to start the hole and to kind of flex out the, uh, the rope. And you just find that inside part. Once you find the inside part, it actually expands very easily. And then that once you got it started like that, it'll be easier to use. Then once you've got it kind of loosened up, you could take the other end, the tag end, and then just kind of work it into that same hole like that so it got it started and then you're just going to slowly work it down as best as you can just take your time like I said it's one of those deals while it's loose everything slides nicely but if you bind down on it then it'll lock up on you just take your time Try to keep it in the center. It's a lot easier to do with a brand new rope that has uh, 
not been compressed. So I use this rope a lot, so it's uh, the threads have tightened up a bit, but that pin will help really help it uh, to go. Well, that's an easier way. I'm just going to snake it on there, push it, hold it, and then loosen it. Okay, once you get that desired length there, okay, it's, it's gone in there, you could start tightening it now. Just kind of pull on it, and then you can pull from the end, and that is done. It is not coming out, okay? And you have a nice, perfect splice in there, no knots, and you have a perfect loop, and then with this loop, you can insert and stuff, you can still tie it just like a regular rope, and it's good to go. For this next tip is my DIY kayak stand. I uh, just made out of some basic uh, PVC here and uh, I actually made these for the place I was living in Key Largo when I had uh, two kayaks and I had a, just an open spot to store them so I designed these real quick and easy to make pretty cheap um, and this held out well um, I actually used this one to also uh, hold my uh, outboard motor and then it allows me to flush it out so it's a good uh, dual usage there uh, but uh, ultimately there's different ways to store kayaks just depending on where you're living like this one here I uh, did it doing the stand up so it's on the point there all the weight um, but this is just more accessible very heavy to lift so lying it on its side is a lot better uh, you could put it on its uh, top side down you could put it on a rack with the bottom on straps but this has just worked out for me um, kind of keeps it up and tight and uh, keeps the uh, rain from pulling on it and then it's quick and easy for me to uh, drop it down and roll it out when I am ready to load it up just like that but uh, I'll show you those rack here in a second okay here are my PVC racks kayak racks uh, I made these out of Schedule 40, uh, one inch PVC is the core frame of it, and then just used the corresponding uh, 90 degree angle bends and uh, fittings there. Um, I've got these, uh, just like I had some extra ones for padding, not hugely helpful. I would definitely invest in some good padding if you live somewhere where it's going to have a, a lot of extreme hot weather. Uh, so just to prevent your kayak and all these contact points um, This one is the one I use for the outboard So I actually before I put it together I put an, uh, an overlay of another PVC on the one inch and then this is a uh, where my uh, outboard will clamp to it and Then it's flexible so it'll spin there um, Then I can work on the kayak and I mean work on the outboard and twist it out of the way and so forth But otherwise that's the wreck um, got the kayak loaded uh, waiting for UPS if he shows up early enough then I might hit the water today if not then I go tomorrow so that is that this next tip is for those owners of one of these Yak Attack Visicarbon Pros um, it's basically a flagpole with a uh, light at the end and then you can get different kinds of mounts for uh, your kayak but pretty good units 90 bucks these days. Woo I think I've had one for four years or something like that. But anyways, um, the tip I'm going to share with you is that I have a problem with salt water kills everything. That's my, that should be my core saying, but it does. And these guys, their little light module, it's basically a two LED. They sell replacement ones for $10 or you can get the four LEDs for $15. But I just keep burning them out, and what it is is the corrosion gets to them. Um, my stuff just gets saturated in, in salt water, and, and just stuff just doesn't survive. And I bought one replacement for it, and I think it lasted three months or something like that, and that pisses me off. But um, I knew that just keep buying these things was just not going to be functional. Um, so what I came up with is a cheap way of fixing that is to bypass these little modules and just go to a flashlight. And where I went 
too is I just got a little flashlight from the dollar store. It's a single LED, but realistically, it always, this is just as bright with this single dollar store LED than it was ever with these two LEDs. I don't know what the problem was. I don't think the connections are all that great. These things are pretty, pretty crappily made to be honest. Um, but I also saw, if you want a hardcore one, um, I think uh, Home Depot sells one for 15 bucks. All you have to do is basically find a little little flashlight, LED flashlight that'll fit in the housing and then you just use the sand cover. And boom. You've got the light. Okay. And I've got it so I could jam it in the cover. Um, this is a, a real small one, but because it's the only one that fit, it's a dollar one, and it lodges in there, and it's still brighter than that thing ever was with just a single, and it basically will stay nice and dry up there. Um, just a quick, cheap replacement. Like I said, all you have to do, what fits in here is uh, AA batteries, so the, the housing fits a AA battery. Um, it's got some little um, uh, runners that keep that narrow this tube down to the um, AA batteries. But you could always cut those out if you wanted to put a larger battery and um, flashlight in there. But if you get a little pen flashlight that utilizes uh, AAA batteries and it's just a narrow housing, that should slide in there perfectly. The head should stick out and this cover would basically cover that in and you would have a super, super bright one. I still might do that, we'll have to see, but uh, this one just happened to work out of the uh, the ones that I got, so I'll stick with that for now. But anyways, that is the one dollar solution that'll fix your music car. Okay, for this last tip, uh, you ever been on the water? You forgot your measuring stick? Catch something that you don't know what the size is if it meets the requirements? So what are you gonna do? Okay, so. This tip here will help you with that because it's something that you'll always have a measuring device for that target species that you tend to hit the most. So for example, I use I catch a lot of mangrove snappers. Um, I want to know make sure that they're above the 10 inch minimum size requirements. How do I know if I don't have my measuring devices? So if you get a tape measure, okay, take your arm, okay, and what you're gonna do is just measure discerning parts of your arm there to, and identify the, the areas that have a certain length. What I suggest is that you can use your, your um, crease in your elbow on the front forearm there and then to all these different points along your hand. So if I put that point down, like I have a fish here, it would be the same way. I'm going to bend that over. I'm going to put the measuring thing and then where it really comes into the 10 inch mark is right here if I bend my thumb make a point there from that crease to that end of that point is exactly 10 inches. So I catch a fish, but I'm not sure the length of it. If it's going to fit the 10 inch requirement I put my elbow down there right next to it and if it's to that point or bigger, boom I know it's legal. Now of course if it's like borderline there and you're you're squishing the head and you're pitching the tail, you probably are better to throw it off anyways and just go for something bigger. Get 12 or 13 inch. That way you have a nice fillet on there. But anyways, use those for your measuring devices. Just measure different lengths on your body. You can use it on your leg, your elbows, whatever, just to get those certain fish species that you need to know the minimum, maximum lengths if you have a slot. And it's a good way to rough, roughly knowing or if you're doing a uh, bragging rights picture, you can know and be able to say with confidence yeah that was 27 inches so anyways that is the rounds up the tips for the day uh have a good one